and I'm a regional director for Asia and the Pacific at International Idea Office. And a very warm welcome to this very first uh, session in our webinar series on democratic development in Melanesia. I'm so very glad that you are all able to, to join us. Together with our Melanesian partners, we came to think that now is an opportune time to discuss the state of democracy in the region and the reforms that may be considered. And so International Idea 2 will intensify its work and attention to the region. The Pacific Islands is sprawling with democracies and a lot of knowledge and experiences can be shared with, uh, with one another. And to reflect also this, our International Ideas Global State of Democracy Indices um, is expanding its data for the Pacific, starting with three Melanesian countries, in, in addition to Papua New Guinea, which is already part of the indices, but we will now expand the, the data gathering to Vanuatu, Fiji and Solomon Islands and hopefully to include more of the Pacific in, in days to come. These indices can be found from uh, our website in, in a couple of months' time. This online uh, webinar series will be held monthly and will feature democracy building topics relevant to the Melanesian region, such as women in politics, civil society advocacy, money in politics, climate change, and, and so on. Often using a particular country as a case study, just as for, for today's uh, seminar. And it is our hope that this seminar um, or this webinar, not only the participants will not only gain knowledge, but also able to exchange views with one another during and after the webinar through various uh, channels. This pandemic, that pandemic has provided uh, us all with an opportunity for online communication and discussions. And uh, even, even when at times we may feel a bit of a Zoom fatigue and miss those face-to-face -face interactions, um, this still provides us with an unparalleled opportunity to come together and talk a range of issues in, 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 in spite of the physical uh, distance. So I hope we can make uh, most of it and then appreciate the, the physical time together even more when, when it happens. So we do wish that you are able to participate our monthly webinar and do send us any feedback that, uh, that you may have also in terms of uh, topics that uh, you think we should be, should be covering. So today we have the honor of starting with one of the world's leading experts on what it comes to electoral systems, Mr. Alan Wall. And this session will be facilitated by another expert and influencer, uh, Niles Lal from uh, Dialogue Fiji. So let me ex also extend my very special welcome to Serena Sajinjian, who is our member of International IDEA Board of Advisors and joining us uh, I believe from uh, Papua New Guinea. Welcome again to everyone and hope you uh, enjoy and participate in today's discussion. Over to you, Niles. Thank you very much, uh, Lina, for the welcome note and for those insights into this uh, webinar series. Uh, so, uh, as has been mentioned by uh, Lina, my name is Niles Lal, I'm the executive director of Dialogue Fiji which is one of the uh, Fijian CSO partners of International IDEA. And um, I'm uh, very pleased to be uh, moderating this uh, first of the webinars under this series. And I thank you all for your uh, participation. And I definitely look forward to uh, some great interactions over the next hour or so. So uh, before any further ado, I'm going to uh, now invite uh, uh, Mr. Alan Wall, who is going to be the uh, main speaker for this webinar to uh, deliver his presentation. Before I do that, I will um, briefly introduce uh, Alan. Uh, he is, you have a discharge from the flyer that was sent. Uh, he is a senior global elections expert. Um, Alan is an electoral management and democracy development specialist with over 35 years 
of management and consulting experience in electrical management and planning, <clears throat> electrical capacity building and training, electrical law, law reform, voter registration, electrical systems, qualitative research, public opinion surveys, civic and electrical education, program evaluation, electrical integrity promotion, gender, disability and youth inclusion, advocacy, political party and political finance regulation, electoral dispute resolution and electoral observation. Alan is based in Australia at the moment and uh, today he's going to be spe uh, speaking on the electoral system of Fiji and specifically on the electoral formula and ballot design. So uh, I'd now like to invite Alan to uh, deliver the presentation which I believe he has prepared uh, for this webinar. And then we will uh, proceed on to uh, accepting interactions from the audience. So, uh, um, Alan. Thanks so much. Please excuse my voice, everyone. I've got a rather bad cold, and if I start coughing and spluttering, I may have to take a break for a couple of seconds. But I do have to take a break for a couple of seconds first, just to get this PowerPoint presentation up on screen. So, if you can. Bear with me for a minute. I will do that. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, it's coming. And all we're going to do now is start it. My computer wants to work. Great. It's there. Okay, now before we start talking about the electoral system in Fiji and the specific things in terms of the uh, electoral formula and ballot paper design, I'd just like to give a couple of parameters with which we, we can frame this discussion. We need to understand that while electoral systems can facilitate certain outcomes, they can't determine them. Um, another issue is, of course, that no electoral system is neutral and none of them is really inherently fair. Fairness tends to be a subjective judgment by people depending on which objectives they think are most important that the electoral system actually achieves. Now, for example, is an electoral system that has totally inclusive representation but results in weak governance fairer yeah. to the population than one which provides more concentrated representation but effective government? Uh, in Fiji, representativeness of parliament was one of the, the major critical issues, a major criteria the NCBBF used to assess fairness. However, when you look at the history in Fiji, the move from the plurality majority system to an open list, supposedly more inclusive system has not resulted in a more inclusive or representative parliament. In the 2006 election, 94% of parliamentary seats were held by two major parties. That hadn't changed under the second election in 2018 under open list PR. Now, we know from other experience that this changes like this can take a while to flow through to greater representativeness. Um, in New Zealand, it took four elections. In uh, Sri Lanka, for example, it took three. So it can be a long-term change rather than a short-term fix when you mess around with electoral systems and electoral formulae. Open list PR, what's being used in Fiji, it's used in 39 countries solely and another four as part of a, a hybrid system. The thing about open list PR is it's more of a concept than an electoral system. There's almost as many versions of it as there are countries that use it. Um, and Fiji has a, has a unique combination of features and these impact particularly on ballot design. They have a single nationwide large magnitude electoral district, 51 seats up in the one district. They have a voting method by which voters vote only for a single candidate, and they have relatively high barriers for party registration and no provision for non-party, or, or as you'd probably call independent, lists of candidates. Now, this combination of three things is unique to Fiji amongst open list systems. And we also need to understand what open list systems do and don't do. They are proportional representation systems. So no matter who you vote for, the candidate vote totals do not determine which candidates or which party lists win seats. The whole impact and emphasis is on how many list, uh, how many votes the actual list gets, not how many votes the candidates get. So if a candidate wins a high number of personal votes, if their party list doesn't win many votes overall, they may not get a seat. 
Conversely, if candidates win few votes, but if they have a rock star or really popular candidate heading the list or somewhere on the list that ensures that that party list wins a number of seats, then candidates with few votes may actually get into parliament. Now, this is a design feature. It is proportional representation. The basis of representation is the party list, not the individual candidate votes. If people want to have their representation based on individual candidate votes, they need a totally different type of electoral system, something like S, uh, SNTV or a plurality majority system like first past the post. Now, in all PR systems, the major issue is how votes for a list are transformed into seats. And I have up here on screen the two major ways in which this is done, the largest remainder method and the highest average method, and some examples of different variations of these and how the mathematics of these are worked out, which I'm, I'm not going to go through. I just want to mention a couple of things. One, these different mathematical formulae may give different results. And this very much depends on how many lists are contesting the election and what the distribution of votes is between these lists. Um, Fiji, of course, uses the DOMP formula. And <clears throat> the DOMP formula, as we'll see in a minute, is probably one of the least proportional of all the ways of transforming votes into seats. Overall, the largest remainder systems are the most transparent and the easiest for sort of non-technical people to understand. However, on the other hand, the highest average systems tend to have a more equal average number of votes as a cost for winning a seat. So in some ways, they, they, they more evenly distribute votes to seats. Now, just an example of how DOMP could be not proportional. The favourite one of mine is, in, and this is an extreme example, in 2011 in Tunisia, the Constituent Assembly was run on a hair largest remainder system. And the party, the largest party with 37% of the vote, won 41% of the seats. Now, if you'd used DOMP instead to distribute to actually allocate the seats, the result would have been totally different. With 37% of the vote, the largest party would have ended up with 69% of the seats. And that's purely because of the distribution of votes and the number of small contestants or small voting power contestants contesting the election. In 2000, the Council of Europe did a tabulation of the um, seat allocation processes from most proportional to least proportional outcomes, the largest remainder and highest average. And you can see here that they assess DONT as having probably the one of the least proportional, and that is least representative results. Now, DONT may tend to favour dominant political party lists which have large percentages of the votes. On the other hand, the St. Lague systems, also the other family of highest average systems, tend to be more proportional in outcome and more likely to give seats at the margin to lower scoring lists and resulting in a more inclusive representative body. So you need to think of what is the objective of the electoral formula in Fiji, of the electoral system? Is it to maximise inclusive representation as NCBBF was uh, advocating? Is it to provide assured government within a PR system? Is it to promote a balance between stability and representation? I mean, each of these is a justifiable objective and each of these will govern um, the electoral formula that is most appropriate. <laughs> now, when we look at the distribution of these systems, we find that DONT is easily the most popular of any of these seat distribution, or seat allocation systems. There were 30% of countries using open list PR using it. Now, this is also true of PR systems in general that DONT is the most widely used seat allocation system. And it's even more dominant when you look down the bottom where we have got the lines for Hagenbach Bischoff, which is basically gives the same result as a DONT system. So that it basically increases the dominance of DONT. DONT's used in countries such as Austria, Belgium, Brazil, Finland, St. Lague in generally newer democracies, Bosnia, Indonesia, Kosovo, Latvia, modified St. Lague, which is is a result sort of generally partially between Dont and St. Lague in Scandinavian countries and in uh, Poland. Hare, um, the largest remainder hair system used in places like Bulgaria, Honduras, Lithuania, Slovakia, Sri Lanka. And let's look at the practical impact of all this in Fiji. So what I've done here is give a table showing 
the 2018 vote totals for all of the political parties at the 2018 election in Fiji, and then distributed or done a seat allocation on each of the major um, seat allocation systems. And we can see what the result is from the DOT method in Fiji, uh, the Imperiali method from Italy, uh, very rarely used. But when we look down, we find that if we use St. Laguay or we use any largest remainder system, we have a slightly different distribution of seats. And one of the small, the smaller party winning seats gets one additional seat and the largest party gets one fewer seat. Now, this may be seen as making parliament more representative. It probably more evenly gives um, votes to, uh, evenly distributes votes in an average number across all the political parties. But this is only one part of the process. There are other things that can affect this distribution. I think one of the big things, if we look at this, I did this again using different thresholds. 5% threshold is the Fiji. I did it with 3% and there was no change. But if you get rid of the threshold, the legal threshold altogether, it has an even greater effect on, um, sorry, on making the parliament more representative if you move to away from Dont and to St. Lagle or most of the largest remainder systems. Here we see under most of these systems, under St. Lagle and most of the largest remainder systems, an additional party enters parliament. And the third largest party gets an additional seat. And these seats may be taken from one or other of the largest two parties. Now, this doesn't mean there isn't a threshold at all. Um, in any system, there's a natural threshold. With 51 seats up for grabs, that natural threshold is about 1.5% of the vote for a party to get a seat. But there's no legal threshold here. What we have to be careful of is note that changing electoral system components can change voting behaviour. So we can't have a certain comparison. <laughs> and also, it, we're trying to take a slice in time. I mean, political behaviour, voting behaviour will change over time. So you can't be sure that if you change one of these components, you're going to get the result that you expect. And lots of electoral system designers have been surprised by the effect of changes to their electoral systems. Okay, now, what other things that are important factors in representativeness, if this is a key goal in Fiji? In Fiji, political party registration thresholds are high. They're in the top 10 of countries around the world. It's around um, 8% um, of people on the voter lists. And that's, that's a very high percentage of, vote, of registered voters that have to support a party for registration. There's also no provision for non-partisan lists to contest the elections. It's much easier for a non-partisan list to get someone elected than if independents have to stand individually. And almost half the countries using open list PR allow non-partisan lists to compete, though, to be honest, they're not successful in very many countries. As you can see, Lord Jordan, Lebanon are the only places where they really have had a significant representation. Moving on to ballot paper design. Um, there's three major issues for open list mainly because you've got to try and show a large number of candidates on the ballot paper so people can actually find the candidate they want to vote for and the party they want to vote for. So you have to try and make the ballot paper as compact as possible while allowing each candidate to be easily identified. So this is for reasons for practicality in a voting compartment and also for reasons of cost. The voters have to be easily able to recognise the party and candidate they wish to vote for and also that candidates should be strongly identified with the party they represent. Now, if they're not, personality issues become prominent and you have a possibility of open list PR fragmenting the party system if personalities are dominating rather than parties. If candidates are strongly identified with the party they represent, policy issues can be more easily the dominant factor. Now, the Fiji ballot at the moment with its numbers in random order, certainly meets the compactness criteria to quite a good extent. But I think most people would see it as failing the other criteria. Now, <coughs> there are bigger problems for ballot design than in many other open list countries in Fiji. Um, no other country using open list PR has such a large magnitude electoral district while requiring voters to vote only for a candidate and not for a list or political party. 
which is quite important. These are, there's significant constraints on how you can design the ballot. When I looked at the FEO's post-election survey during the week, I found it asked questions about how easy did you find it to vote? And what did you think of the layout of the ballot paper? Now, these are far too general really to be able to get an idea about whether the ballot paper is effective or not. It would have been probably more useful to ask voters whether they found it easy to identify the party list and the candidate that they wish to vote for. And that would give probably a better idea about how effective the ballot paper design was. How can it be improved? Now, the proposed Fiji law reform would see party affiliation shown on candidate lists, but not the ballot paper. And to me, this is only a small step to improving design. It doesn't deal with issues like the fact there are no party identifiers on the ballot, that the random order of candidates makes it really difficult to identify which party or which group of candidates represent a party. And this is important both for the voter and also for political parties. In, in PR systems, parties generally have some control, whether by internal primaries or their members or other means, on the order in which their candidates appear on the ballot. I mean, this is an internal party matter. It's important that there's fairness in voting between the parties, but within the party lists, normally that is up to the party to control. Um, and it helps party discipline and it helps party cohesion. Now, in some extent, then the Fiji ballot paper design seems to be sort of opposed to the, the general intent of PR to pool votes to parties. Instead, it seems to reinforce an emphasis on individuals and personalities. And to some extent, it seems to appear to favour lists dominated by a big personality. So how can it be changed? It'd be great to be able to look at international exams and say, hey, we could do that. Unfortunately, um, it's not quite that easy, um, mainly because in all similar district magnitude jurisdictions, Okay, with 50 or more seats up in a single district, the voter must vote first for a party and then a candidate, which means you can do different things with your ballot paper design. But let's look at some of the things that have been done. Um, <coughs> firstly, Kosovo. Again, here, similar to Fiji, you've got numbers for the candidates, but you have on the left all of the parties listed. So you vote for a party and then you select the candidate numbers, and similarly to Fiji, there's an index of these in each voting compartment for that particular party. Let's look here. This is similar from Colombia for the Senate. Only this does the ballot paper horizontally and only has as many numbers for each political party as there are candidates standing on their list for the, the seats available. And then, and this is probably most relevant to, um, to Fiji, this is the Netherlands. Now, in the Netherlands, they have up to 80 candidates per political party. They list them all by name under the party header. True, in the Netherlands, you do have to vote for a party as well, but you need not put, if you wanted to only vote for the candidate, you need not put a box beside the party and just list the candidates under the party header. It does result in a bigger ballot paper than Fiji, but it is not enormously oversized and it does allow clear identification of each candidate and which party they belong to on the ballot paper. Okay, a couple of others. And these are more modern design concepts showing logos, showing initials for the parties, showing symbols, showing photos of the candidates and candidate numbers. The first here is from Honduras, makes it very easy for voters to be able to identify who they want to vote for. Um, Honduras has a maximum district magnitude of 25, so only half that of Fiji. So it would be a much bigger ballot paper if it was this style in Fiji. And secondly, reversing the way in which the ballot's shown from Ecuador, where the candidates are listed vertically. Now, again, in Ecuador, the maximum district magnitude is 15. And in both these countries, voters vote only for the candidate as they do in Fiji. They don't vote for the party as well. Now, there are some other off the wall or more extreme solutions. Brazil, which has a district magnitude of up to 70, uses electronic voting machines. And Slovakia, which has OLPR, open list PR, in one single district of 150 members to be elected, uses a French ballot. That is, each party has its own ballot paper and voters get given a pack of ballot papers and select the ballot paper for the party for which they want to vote and mark the candidate for which they want to vote on that ballot. Now, 
This is not something that's ever been used in countries with an English tradition, probably not appropriate for the Fijian context. It would be a very radical departure. What are some other issues or some other potential ballot design solutions? Well, you could kick the current style of the ballot with numbers, but group the candidates on the ballot by party or list so that voters are much more able to work out which is the party and which candidates from that party they want to vote for. You could print the relevant party symbol beside or behind each candidate number on the ballot. And they would each of these would require minimal change to the way in which the ballot is laid out at present. More radically, you could, and this would require major electoral system change just to get the ballot a little bit easier, you could change to multiple electoral districts of smaller magnitudes, so fewer candidates would be on each ballot, but this has significant impacts on the electoral system. It will make it harder for small parties to win seats, it will reduce inclusiveness, but on the other hand, it may limit the influence of a rock star candidate in a candidate list, so it'll be limited to a particular district rather than affecting the national result. Or even you could modify the voting process that voters vote first for a party, then a candidate. But these last two are major differences that are would, would require a lot of work and a change of philosophy in terms of the electoral system in Fiji. Okay, thanks. Thanks for putting up with my croaky voice at the moment. Uh, Nilesh, I'll hand back to you. And uh, if we have any questions or any discussion, I'm uh, happy to see what we can answer. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen, for that uh, very insightful uh, presentation. So we're, we're now opening this discussion up for uh, questions from the attendees. So if there's any question that uh, you'd like to pose to Ellen, or if there's a comment that you'd like to make in relation to the uh, subject of today's webinar, or even you know on any issue that is related to electoral system design in Fiji in general. So you are most welcome to do that. And uh, you need to use the uh, raise hands feature that is available to you to indicate that uh, you have a question that you'd like to raise. Alternatively, you could send us your questions by uh, using the Q&A pane that you see on the right hand side of your screen. Yeah, you can put in your questions and we'd be able to accommodate those. So um, we definitely look forward to some uh, good questions that would, uh, uh, that would uh, ensure that we have interesting discussions on the subject matter. So whilst we, we are waiting for the attendees to uh, pose the questions, uh, Ellen, um, a question that uh, uh, an issue that I'd like you to uh, talk a bit about uh, is the coattail effect. You know, in Fiji, this has been a contentious issue with a lot of people uh, perceiving it as unfair that candidates with a low number of votes are getting elected into parliament on the coattails of more popular candidates in their party. Recently, there was a lot of discussion on social media uh, when Minister Fayyaz Square, who had polled 547 votes in the last election uh, was appointed as the acting attorney general. Incidentally, the uh, position of uh, attorney general has come to be perceived as a very powerful position in Fiji uh, due to the influence of uh, the incumbent uh, minister, uh, Yasayev Kiyum. So uh, is the coat uh, tail effect a, a bad thing? Uh, you know, does that make the system unfair? Um, okay, as I said before, unfairness is in the eye of the beholder. It's generally in the eye of the loser rather than the winner. Um, the issue is that you're dealing with a proportional representation system. Proportional representation systems are based on how many votes a party list overall wins, no matter how many votes the individual components or candidates within that list win. So, um, it said before, if you if you want votes to people to be elected on the base of their individual votes, you want a system other than proportional representation. Go back to an alternative vote system or a first past the post system or STV. But proportional representation is based on list totals, not candidate totals. Now, okay, you have a choice between open list and closed list. In closed list, no candidate gets any votes at all. 
all the seats are allocated in terms of how many votes the party gets. Now, is that any fairer or less fair than having a system where people have to get some votes or be ranked highest in the number of votes within their party list to be able to win a seat? I mean, that's a matter of individual judgment. But if you're going to have a PR system, you are going and you're going to have the sort of system that Fiji has in voting for candidates only, you are going to have a coattail effect and it is part and parcel of a PR system. Um, you could modify maybe the coattail effect by changing the system as many countries have that you vote for a party first and then vote for a candidate. And that tends to even out the candidate votes because fewer people overall will vote for the candidates than actually vote for the party. It's generally not compulsory. You have to vote for party, may vote for a candidate. Um, but no, I mean, if you don't like the coattail effect, get another election system, get a non-PR system. Yeah, so essentially the alternative is then, then to have a closely system. If one has issues with the uh, coattail effect in a PR system, what you're essentially saying is that uh, the other alternative is a closely system, which in some ways, I mean, not in some ways, which in in a very significant way, then restricts both the choice in as far as choice of candidates are concerned. So if you have a closely system, it is totally up to the party as to how the how the candidates are ordered on their list on the and uh, it's up to the party to determine who are the highest on that list and who it is that gets elected. The voter has no influence apart from perhaps if they're a party member and take part in a party primary in selecting the list as to who actually ends up in the parliament. They're purely voting for the party list. Closed list does have one sort of advantage and that it is easier to get inclusiveness within the party list or within people being elected through requiring that every X number of people on the list rank down be either of different genders or of different ethnicities. So it can be easier than open list to be able to get a more inclusive parliament within each party list, but it does restrict voter choice and leaves it up to the party as to basically which candidates are likely to be elected. So to me, it's probably better for the voter to have some influence than none at all. Um, the other issue, of course, as I said, is if you do change to having um, smaller electoral districts, you can get rid of this rock star effect to a significant extent. It's hard to find lots of rock stars to lead the lists in every electoral district. But but if you're doing that, you're losing on the other hand by making it harder for smaller parties to win seats in those smaller electoral districts. I mean, the problem with electoral systems is, and the way in which you work these different components is each of them has advantages and disadvantages. There's not one thing that is clearly better in doing everything than any other system. And the whole issue is to try and get the balance as close as possible as to what you want the objective of the electoral system to be. Mm -hmm. So the inherent uh, disadvantage there for the other uh, political parties would be that uh, there are too many, uh, there are not enough rocksters around then, eh? I guess. So uh, <laughs> so I see Moshmi, you've got your uh, hands up. I believe you have a question for Ellen. Moshmi Bhim. Oh, thank you, Nilesh. Yeah, I was waiting for you to unmute me. Uh, thank you for the nice presentation, uh, Mr. Alan uh, Wall. Uh, yes, and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting uh, the way you have presented how the design of the electoral system affects voter outcomes. And uh, yes, I agree the closed system seems to be worse because then the voters do not get a choice on who to vote for. Um, with regards to the current system in Fiji, I believe uh, why it, it is unfair that a, a person with uh, low votes is able to get into parliament uh, when the leader of their party is able to redistribute their high votes is because in the other party, you, you, have, you have candidates with much higher votes, which end up not having any seats at all. Eh? 
for example, uh, for example, 500 votes by Fayaz and then an SDL and then a Sodelpa candidate who got over 1,500 votes, which is three times the vote that Fayaz got. So I, so I think if, for instance, the, uh, they want to have the leaders of the party who, who, who are able to amass a high number of votes and, um, and, and because it's easy to campaign for a leader who people already know well, and, uh, and then they're able to uh, amass votes from all over the nation, whereas the, the other candidates who are less known would, would have found it easier to get votes within their district if it had been in that system. Yeah, so I, I guess the the unfairness here is the lead <coughs> is the leader of the party who are generally well known for decades, locally and internationally, they are redistributing their their votes. And if the leader of the party is the prime minister ministerial candidate, then their vote should not be redistributed because they are already getting the reward for their vote by becoming the prime minister. And when people vote for the leader of the party, they are making a clear choice that they are voting for that person to lead the nation, I, I believe. And if, if uh, and, and they are not voting for another person to represent the leader of the party. Well, that's my view. Of course, uh, other people's views will, will differ. So, so I think uh, like in the presidential system, the, the the leaders election is conducted their votes are, are voting is done separate from the less uh, rest of the members of of parliament which means the leaders vote is not redistributed uh, to the other party members and, and and i think that would be fairer but that's uh, my view yeah thank you do you want me to respond to that? Um, yes, yes. Yes, response. yes, 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 Ellen, I think uh, yeah. a response is necessary. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, one, one way around this is to move to a presidential system. So you have these super popular people competing in the presidential election. Okay. Rather than taking a lot of votes at the top of their lists. But I mean, I, I, I have difficulty with the idea that the votes are redistributed to other people on the list. They're not. They're distributed to the party. And then the party votes determines how many seats the party gets. And that's the essence of proportional representation. As I said before, if you don't like that, move to an individual candidate based system where individual candidates have to fight it out amongst each other. You're not redistributing votes to other people. You are redistributing your votes or adding your votes to the party, which is a quite different concept. But yeah, a presidential system would help get rid of that, as would um, I agree having um, smaller districts would make it more difficult. But then the downside of that is that if you have smaller districts, for example, your 50 districts were split into five of 10, uh, say five districts of 10, your natural threshold for representation would increase significantly. And it would make it very, very difficult for smaller parties to be able to win seats in the parliament. So that's the downside of that. You might have a more even distribution of votes amongst the candidates from the bigger parties, but smaller parties may find it a lot harder to win a seat at all. So the representativeness overall of the parliament might be a problem. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, but look, the presidential system may be the you know may be a way that you think is fairer, but basically what you're saying is that i'm going to not i am going to deny the votes of everyone who voted for the leading candidate for that party they shouldn't be counted towards what that party wins in the way of seats and that's not fair to those people who voted for the highest rank or the biggest vote winning or the rock star candidate in that party um that's basically denying their votes I think, well, there's a lot of misconception on this issue, and I think it is important that it needs to be emphasized that uh, the PR system is based upon the proportionality between political parties and not proportionality between candidates. 
So you do not need to see what is the proportionality of votes between a uh, uh, the distribution of votes uh, between a Sodelpa candidate and a Fiji Fest candidate for that matter. But rather, what is the proportionality of the vote share of the two parties involved? And the poor two parties get uh, uh, allocated a number of seats based on their aggregate number of votes that they receive. So, uh, thank you, Moshmi, for this question. And can I um, yes, of course. There's a lot easier to see in open list PR systems where voters have to vote for the party first and then vote for a candidate. It's much easier to see that it's the party vote that determines how many seats each party gets. Whereas it's more difficult to both see and to understand and recognise if the party vote is a total of all the individual candidate votes as it is in Fiji. So, but again, it will be a matter of changing the nature of the voting method within the OLPR system. Probably not as big a change as changing to a presidential system, but that would probably solve the problem. Okay. All right. So, uh, there was a question that was sent in earlier, and uh, it is in relation to the, uh, to the uh, electoral formula. So, uh, uh, what do you think are the consequences? Should PG change its electoral formula? To what? Well, uh, it is pretty much open-ended. So, uh, in case there's a change in formula, yep. then what would be the consequences? I suppose that this would tie in also, and you pressed on that. Uh, you know, what are the electoral objectives in Fiji? What, what are some desired electoral outcomes that we want to see? And, uh, um, yeah. well, as, as I noted, the DONT formula is probably the least proportional of the highest average for, um, formula that can be used and does tend to concentrate seats in the largest political and uh, the political party with the largest number of votes. Whether that's a good or not a good thing is a matter of the of the objectives for the system. Whether you want stable government with few parties in coalition or none in coalition, or whether you want to have total inclusiveness, uh, is a matter for people to determine that what's best for their own country. As you saw from, <coughs> I can see if I can can't bring that up easily again at the moment. As you saw from the slide, if you get if you change from don't to St. Laguay in any form or to uh, any largest remainder formula, you get seats moving from the largest party to the smallest party under the voting patterns that were there in 2018. Now, that may not hold if voting patterns change in a future election. It may be a bigger spread. Or as we saw, as sometimes happens, um, you, <coughs> if you have lots of small parties that fall below the 5% threshold, that happens at all, because there are lots of parties falling behind uh, under the 5% threshold would mean that there would be lots of wasted votes and that the votes again will be concentrated, seats again will be concentrated in the larger parties. So it depends on the distribution of votes and number of contestants, what the impact of a change in the electoral formula would be. Uh, it's a little difficult to predict, but all we can do is look at the past data and say, if this voting pattern was the same again, there would be in Fiji a slight move away from the largest party. But again, as I noted, the bigger change would come from getting rid of the 5% threshold. That would make more of a difference in changing yeah. on 2018 voting patterns than just changing the electoral formula. Change the formula and get rid of the 5% threshold. Well, if what people want is broader representativeness, that would be the more effective thing to do. Okay, uh, well, you've done a simulation of the uh, uh, results of 2018 um, and uh, uh, to see what uh, the uh, seat allocation would have been like uh, under the different uh, systems or uh, methodologies for uh, allotment. Um, 
but you know there was in fact a change in voting behavior after the experience of 2014 elections so it would be very interesting also to do a similar simulation for 2014 elections uh, you know in which the smaller parties received a greater share of the uh, of the votes uh, because you know by 2018 a lot of people had given up voting for the smaller parties and the independent candidates in fact by 2018 there were no independent candidates that were participating in elections anymore and then essentially you know these smaller parties which are absolutely cri critical to sustaining a multi-party system in Fiji and bringing in some sort of a moderation in Fijian politics you know from this preoccupation with race that has been there all along so these parties have been inherently caught in a cycle of exclusion uh, whereby people do want to vote for them but they fear that their votes will be wasted just because of the excessively high threshold perhaps not high by international standards but high by, you know the dynamics of the Fijian situation and the desired electoral objectives here it would be very interesting also to do, do a simulation and see you know how many parties would have got uh, uh, inclusion into the parliament or they would have got a seat in parliament had the same lag method being used uh, in 2014 too yeah, and, 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 uh, one more party that, that won seats but this then is the issue each set of votes is going to give you different distribution which we cannot predict for either 2018 or 2014 data what the impact of changing the electoral formula would be in a 2022 election we can say well it's probably more likely there will be more representative but we don't know and in terms of independent candidates um independent candidates in pr systems i, I don't think i'm struggling to recall an instance ever where an Now, where they can win seats is if you allow independent candidates to group together in a, in a list. And that way, they can, all the independent votes can be added together and maybe one of those candidates has got a chance of winning a seat. But standing alone, it's, it's almost impossible for an independent to win a seat in a PR system. Um, so that again is something to consider, should it? independent lists be able to compete, compete in the election. But the threshold is a critical issue. 5%, as you say, is not high by international standards. It's probably around the top of a range for what people like the Council of Europe would think is acceptable. But it's, um, it's, it is a barrier, as is the high number of people that are required to support the registration of a political party. Um, and that's another barrier to people being able to contest the election. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we just like to remind the uh, attendees that uh, you are very much welcome to uh, pose questions and to contribute to the uh, deliberations that we're having. You can indicate your intent to pose a question by raise, using the uh, raise hands feature that you have. Um, Okay, so going uh, forward or, or proceeding further, there's another question that uh, I had for you, Ellen, and uh, this relates, uh, you know, to, uh, to to another contentious issue in Fiji, which is uh, about the separation between the two electoral management bodies. A lot of people in Fiji have the perception that the electoral commission and the Fijian elections office need to be independent of each other. Uh, in fact, I had posed this question to the electoral expert uh, in the uh, multinational observer group of 2018. And he told me that there is no requirement uh, internationally that, uh, and you know, that is definitely not the practice internationally, that EMBs need to be independent of each other. So what is your view on the on that? Do you think that there should be a separation between the uh, Fijian Electoral Commission uh, and the Fiji Electoral Commission? Okay, as a first, the first comment on this, let me just emphasize that the structure of an EMB is not the determinant of its behavior. It's the behavior, it's the attitudes of the EMB staff and members that determine the behavior. 
There are lots of election commissions called independent that are anything but independent in their action. There are election commissions that are in two parts that perform well. There are others that don't perform well. So the structure really is not the determining factor. There is no requirement that they be uh, at all independent of each other. The more normal practice would be that an independent body in name or in reality actually is a single body that manages the election. There aren't as many bodies like in the Fiji model that has an independent commission and then a bureaucratic, a separate bureaucratic um, sort of implementation arm, if you like. And when you have that, you have all sorts of issues. Now, I work for a lot of people, they have that there. It works quite well because each of the parties knows their respective powers and knows what, you know, and, and knows how to relate to each other. I've been in places like Mozambique where it works particularly badly because it's become incredibly politicised in the bureaucratic level and there's no clear lines of authority. One of the things you have to do if you've got this bifurcated model is work out what it is the election commission actually does. Does it just set the, um, the administrative arm, bureaucratic arm to get on and, and implement it? What sort of monitoring oversight powers does it have over that arm? Do the members of the commission take particular responsibility for particular areas of operations or activity? in the separate administrative arm. <laughs> and all of these things can, uh, to me, this separate model is the more, is a, a more difficult one to get to work effectively than a model where there is a single structurally and in reality independent body. Um, it can be, it can be useful where, if it, in transitions where you want to have either a politically representative body as the commission and then bureaucrats doing the actual work, or if you want the great and good of civil society to form the commission who don't actually have to do any administration work, but just set vague policy goals and let people get on with managing the electoral process. But it, it's, a more, it's a more difficult problem to make work effectively. But there's certainly no requirement that it be like that or not be like that. <laughs> and I'd have to, okay. have to go and sort through, look, which I haven't got in front of me now, to I'd have data somewhere on how many commissions have these various structures. But let me emphasise again that the important thing for an election management body is that it has autonomy of action, not its particular structure. And you can have autonomy of action no matter what your structure. It depends on the behaviour of the people who are the election managers. Yes, Ellen, thanks for that. Uh, in Fiji at the moment, they are proposing electoral reforms, and part of the re reforms includes increasing the powers of the ele electoral commission here. So uh, having autonomy of uh, of power or action is okay as long as um, that body is actually also controlled by regulations that uh, that prevent it from making decisions that will harm the other political parties you know, that are not uh, uh, part of the ruling party. Because uh, in the uh, the past elections that we've had in Fiji. The courts during election time have made decisions, uh, some of the decisions which have favored the ruling party members and have uh, actually uh, been uh, acted against the interest of the other candidates that were not part of the ruling party. So that's why in, in that regard, uh, the perception whether members of the electoral commission are independent or are, are they known to have been supporters in some way of the ruling party are uh, can actually uh well it can have an effect or uh in the way elections are done because it's some of the decisions of the members i mean or, or the Director of the Electoral Commission can have uh, can can affect the election outcome. So, yes. 
It's not the structure that counts, it's the behaviour of the people in the positions that determines how independent that management is. Now, in terms of political party support, is there, um, I mean, some election commissions work on a balance of terror. Basically, where you sort of acknowledge representatives of people with links to the various political parties sitting within the commission and fighting with each other. Not not necessarily a great model, but you can you can structure if you wanted to the criteria for eligibility to be a member of the commission to make sure that you can limit at least as far as is practically possible the. Um, the appointment of people who are going to be influenced by political party to those jobs and you can't prevent it because uh, it's it, again it's a matter of individual behavior and people who've been members of parties or people who are known supporters of political parties becoming members of election management bodies um, you can put codes of conduct in place for the election management body members that they have to adhere to that are justiciable. Um, but I mean, you, it's a matter of ethics and behaviour. You can't totally legislate to prevent political influence in an election management body. Uh, yes. No matter yes. what its structure. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. So uh, there's another question, Ellen, that I had received. So how? Can you mitigate the notoriously large uh, size of OLPR system uh, ballot should the party symbols and all ca uh, candidate names are included? So what, are, what are some of the other <laughs> well, I mean, the, the, the number system that Fiji is using is probably the way of mitigating the size. However, the problem in Fiji is it totally destroys any link to any political party. Um, it doesn't group candidates by party and it gives no indication, it doesn't list, um, it gives no indication of which party it is to. I mean, it, it, you, as in Kosovo, as an example I showed, you can use the numbers and still allow people to identify which party um, that they, and not have a large ballot paper. You could have a group of numbers by political party um, on the ballot. And again, uh, you and the party identified at the top of each column or row of numbers, as in the Columbia example before, you could then um, basically vote vote for the candidate, and you would minimise the size of the ballot. It's not great ballot design by international standards. International. Standards are moving towards making it as clear as possible who the candidates are on the ballot paper itself. But it's a mitigation method that could be used with OLPR. I mean, the other thing, as we've talked about before, is reduce the size of the electoral districts. And you're going to have fewer candidates to fit on each ballot paper. But that has other impacts that are probably going to be more negative than you're going to get benefits for in ballot, in ballot paper design. Um, <coughs> So you could work with the current ballot and group by party, have a party symbol at the end of the, at the end of each column and then list the numbers and still have in the voting compartment a index of numbers of each candidate against their number on the ballot paper. <laughs> I think uh, the intent uh, behind the complete randomization that we see on our ballot paper is to ensure that you know the ballot design does not accord any a priori advantage to any candidate because even if we were to uh, have all the party candidates uh, listed with you know every candidate uh, you know uh, polling uh, uh, you know within a column for the party so that is how it was going to be arranged then i suppose the one the candidate at the top you know, who whose number would be closest to the party symbol would actually receive an advantage, which can, you know, in some ways also exacerbate the uh, cocktail effect if the political party leader is put right on top next to the party symbol. So uh, I think, you know, in, in that case, there would need to be two levels of pros 
to ensure complete randomization because then questions would then be asked uh, on uh, you know who decides the order in which political parties are listed so who falls on the left then who which uh, you know is the next one uh, next party uh, uh, to, to fall on the uh, ballot paper so the, these are the questions that would need to be to be uh, to be considered there too uh, in fact we welcome the change in the uh, bill uh, number 52 sorry bill number 50 of uh, 2020 which has proposed changes uh, to the law where you know the national candidates list is now allowed to be brought into the voting booth so then uh, uh, voters do get a chance to verify uh, whether they're voting for the candidate of their choice should they forget the number so uh, you know, th these are some of the issues that would need to be considered uh, given that one of the intents is to have complete and a randomization and to eliminate any sort of a priori advantage to any candidate or political party um and i would see that as as not being in line with the proportional representation system you're you're looking for a candidate you're looking for a ballot paper that's more at home in a um majority plur a plurality majoritarian system rather than the pr system can we get back to this thing pr is about parties it's not about yeah. candidates yeah. right but so, so what, what we have in fiji is that people have a problem with the coattail effect so if we actually have a random i mean a ballot design that gives you know further advantage to certain candidates then it would be perceived to be a problem unless of course you know we, we We've got a lot of work to do, obviously, civil society organizations um, yeah. who need to, you know, command greater trust and confidence across, you know, the political spectrum that, you know, the PR system is not necessarily about candidates. It is about political parties. Yeah. And, so, uh, and there seems to be a lack of understanding of that. And I mean, from my point of view, and it may not always be shared, um, the political party has an absolute right to determine what order its candidates are going to be on the ballot. These candidates are representing that party. They are not representing that an, an individual in themselves. They're there as a representative of a party. So um, obviously the party, um, you have to have a, things in place to make sure that parties don't get an advantage and you can do that through randomization or double randomization of where parties appear of determining the order of parties on the ballot. You can do things like they do in Tasmania in Australia and have what they call a Robson rotation of parties on the ballot. So each party appears, parties appear in different positions on an equal number of ballot papers so that none gets an overall advantage. But in terms of PR, to me, parties have an absolute right to determine where their candidates are shown on their list. It's not a matter for the EMB to do that. I could perhaps okay. come at a situation where the, they, uh, they're grouped by parties, but the EMB holds a lottery amongst each candidate as to where that candidate appears on the list. And one of the issues also, I mean, some countries could try and get around this coattail effect by saying, if you don't get X percent of your party's vote, you don't come into the seat allocation, which can create problems as to who actually then wins that seat if, a lot, if only few people actually pass that second representation quota. But there are a number of countries with open list PR that actually do that. <laughs> but, I mean, PR is about parties. It's not about candidates. That's the basis of the system. And that it, um, if, if Fiji wants a PR system, there's going to have to be work done to educate people as to what the PR system actually means. <laughs> okay, because so I'm mindful of that. They're not used to it. I mean, it's not, it's yeah. not usual in English speaking country, uh, people with an English heritage. We're more, much more used to plurality majority systems where candidates are the focus. And that, of course, was Fiji's history as well. So it's a major change and it requires a lot of work to get people to understand what this difference is. Because at the moment, they're trying to maintain as many as possible of the elements of a 
how the majority of the PR system. But the two things don't gel with the majority. <laughs> okay, I'm mindful that uh, time has caught up uh, with us, but uh, there's one last question that we're going to take from Elam Prasad, because I see that she had a hand up for quite some time. So we'll quickly take that question from Neelam. Um, sorry, it's not Neelam. We are short of time. So we logged in through whoever registered. This is the supervisor of elections. Um, okay. Uh, thank you, Alan, for an excellent presentation. I'm very grateful that uh, uh, someone with uh, uh, electoral experience of my age has been able to literally spill the beans on the system we have in Fiji so that it becomes a bit more uh, simpler compared to how I've tried to explain it all this while. So hats off to you, Mike. Uh, okay. I, just wanted to, I just wanted to run two things uh, that I think you have endorsed uh, quite, uh, quite well. Uh, there is a big misconception in PG that open list PR system is a mixture of first past the post system and the uh, first preference system, preferential system that we had. Um, what I've tried to do on numerous occasions, and this is where a lot of the people have uh, made made mistakes with this, to assume that it's a mixture of the other two systems, whereas it's a completely different system. It's based on political parties, and it's a party list that comes for nomination and the candidates fall under the party. And it's further strengthened by the constitution to say there are no by-elections. In fact, if a party candidate loses his seat in parliament, he's simply replaced by the person next in the list. And it could even go to an extent where there may be someone who received 100 votes and the person is able to get into parliament because there is nobody else left in the party list. So um, uh, I know no, no, the new word coat tail effect and all these things. Uh, I think um, uh, it's going to be even greater uh, a problem for people to understand when someone with 100 votes get into parliament simply because there's nobody else left in that list. So uh, I think um, that's one misconception you have cleared. Um, the other one that I wanted to, to agree with you is in terms of uh, the changes in the rules. Uh, I mean, which formula do you use? Uh, Saint Lage or the Dehaunt or, uh, or the Hair Rule or whatever. At the end of the day, if a party does not reach the 5% threshold, you will not have a greater distribution of seats. You might just move one seat from this party to that, and then one seat from the party to this. In fact, the, the challenge is for the party to first meet the 5% threshold. Even if you calculate the 2014 election or the 2018 election, it's, it's all to do with one seat going out of PG first to NFP in 2018, or one seat going out of Sudelpa to NFP in 2014, uh, using either the same flag A or the Dijon flag. I think the competition in PG is more about um, what rule is better or what rule is best. But I, I agree with you, it's just been two elections. What if the, in the next election you go with the same flag A rule and you have a, what Nilesh likes to call a hung parliament? And, and just before I close, I just thought it would be a wise for you to, uh, to also little bit explain about what is a hung parliament. Right now we have 27 to 20, uh, 21 to 3. Um, whereas I would assume a hung parliament is when you have a 25, 25 or 26, 25. Um, not really, but uh, I think um, uh, it will be a worthy point to address. Uh, anyway, thank you very much, Alan. Uh, appreciate your uh, presentation. It's very thorough and I look forward to receiving a, a copy so that I can use it for my future presentation. Okay, I'll send you one. <laughs> Thanks for the comment. Can I just get back to this issue of people looking back into the past as to the past system? Um, yeah, I'm, it's not FPTP, it's not alternative vote, it's something totally different. And I think if we're talking about a hung parliament, we're going back into the past again. Hung parliament is a term you use with majority plurality systems where you have obvious winners and losers. In PR systems, it is more likely than not that you will have a coalition government. It's not that you've got a hung parliament. The idea of PR is to try and um, 
basically to promote negotiation and conciliation between different political forces. I don't have the data sitting in front of me now, but I can I can find it if you like. But the vast majority of governments that come out of PR systems are coalition governments. They're not hung parliaments. They PR forces parties to negotiate to form a government to try and get a broader based government. Now it has the downside that it could be less stable than a majoritarian or plurality based parliament. But I, they don't have hung parliaments in PR. They have negotiations to form a coalition. <laughs> okay, uh, I think there's a point that was raised by Senium that I need to comment on, which uh, relates to uh, the uh, uh, the fact that you know parties need to first cross the threshold and then only can they get representation and then uh, the fact that uh, the uh, seed allocation method uh, used only comes into play uh, or it is only going to have an effect only after uh, the uh, threshold uh, is met so um, uh, one of the reasons why we have been advocating for a uh, uh, departure towards or a adoption, uh, adoption of the St. Lag method is because the DOM system has, uh, you know, from our the experience of the two elections, actually afforded a marginal benefit uh, to the larger parties. So, uh, given uh, PG's dynamics, we do not want to move towards a two party system, which has essentially been the case. Uh, and which has been the outcome under the 1997 constitution, which led to two race based parties, uh, you know, being the only parties that uh, gain representation in parliament. And it had a polarizing effect uh, on, the, on the electorate and uh, on, on the general nature of politics, which led to a race based politics in Fiji. So we want a uh, electoral system that actually rewards smaller parties and which uh, you know does not uh, uh, eventually lead to a part two party system which can very well happen in Fiji's case because as i've said earlier on uh, the uh, the smaller parties are uh, sort of getting caught in this perpetual cycle of exclusion and uh, you know in the future there will come a time when there will be no longer smaller parties that would be contesting elections. So in order to sustain the multi-party system, we need to have a system that rewards uh, uh, moderate and smaller parties. Um, so um, I believe that uh, uh, unless there's any further comments or questions. That, uh, I think my okay. mic is for you, so I can speak if you don't okay, mind. Uh, you can Okay, of course. Um, with all due respect, uh, from 2014, there has been an argument in PG, and I suppose Ellen can run the numbers for you, uh, that it's going to a two-party system. But if you look at the vote distribution in the 2018 election and use that as a baseline, you will note that it is now expanding into a three- or four-party system. After the transition election in PG, the incumbents came in with the majority vote, but following that in the second election, and I was thinking the trend will continue in the third election, is that the number of votes is going to get distributed as more and more uh, parties become popular and come up with more uh, central views on, on issues. So um, whilst it's, a, 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 it's not proven in 2014 that PG is moving to a two-party system, if we look at the votes NFP got, it was more than 2014. So uh, essentially, you are looking at in, uh, what Ellen said, the coalition heading forward. You might have more coalition uh, into the next few elections. So uh, in terms of uh, this uh, theory, that we are heading to a two-party system. I think the votes are proving it wrong. Uh, that said, thank you very much. I think there's some evidence if you consider the uh, voting behavior in the two elections that have been held that people have actually shied away from voting for the smaller parties um, in the second of the two elections, which means that uh, 
people do think that if they vote for parties which don't have a reasonable chance of crossing the threshold, uh, their vote will be wasted. So uh, uh, eventually, we believe this will impact on the uh, on the uh, sustainability of a multi-party system in Fiji. But well, time will tell. And uh, but but there's some evidence to attest to to that view. Uh, if you uh, analyze the results of the two elections under the PR system that have been held so far. Okay, so uh, I believe there's no further comments or questions. So uh, that brings us to the end of this webinar. I'd like to uh, once again thank you, Ellen, for your uh, very insightful presentation. And I think uh, the responses that you made to uh, different questions that were posed during the course of the webinar have also allied a number of concerns and clarified a number of issues pertaining to elections and to election administration in Fiji uh, as well. So uh, thank you once again to everyone that uh, joined us this afternoon. And uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, by Lena, this is only the first of the uh, webinars that we would be holding under the Democratic Development in Melanesia webinar series. So we definitely look forward to your uh, participation and contribution in the upcoming webinars. So on behalf of International Idea, thank you once again, and we look forward to your continued support in the future. Thank you. So just before you go, Lina, would you like to? Okay, that's all right. Okay, so thank you, Ellen, once again. And uh, from uh, here in Fiji, Nisa Mode.